Hey y'all, it's Jonathan back with another video. I'm coming to you at the end of 2022 with my top five books of the year. I know it's been a minute. I have done a couple of clips recently. Um, I uploaded one of my TikToks up on here, um, which is actually a clip from my Patreon. Uh, but we'll talk about that in a second. But I'm here to give you my top five reads of 2022. It's been a very interesting year. Um, I haven't read as much as I wanted to. Um, I went back and I looked at my Goodreads and I was like, I was thinking I read a little bit more. But um, it's definitely been quite the year. So um, I'm excited to talk about my favorites. Excited to give you guys a little bit more content before the end of the year. Um, talking about my least favorites, giving you an overview of everything I read during the year. So we'll see how much content I get recorded today. And then those videos will be coming out over the next couple of days. Um, just a few quick announcements before we get into this video. Um, so, I do have a Patreon. So, if you feel like you want to see a little bit more exclusive content, definitely subscribe to my Patreon. On there, I do a weekly book tales video where I mix up a cocktail and talk about books. Also, on my Patreon, I'll be giving everybody schedules as to uploads for the month, um, lists of what I've been reading exclusive reviews, that sort of thing. So my Patreon has two tiers, my Elin tier and my Baldwin tier, and those have a few different uh, levels of content on them. But I'm super excited to upload more on Patreon and moving into 2023, uploading more here on my channel. So, you know, head over to Patreon, subscribe if you guys like that. But we're here for the books. We're here for my top five books of 2022. If you're interested in seeing my favorites, which I hope you'll pick up in the coming year, keep on watching and let's get right into this video. So I will say that it really, it was kind of hard picking out my top five. Now I did want to include some extras in this video, but I'm like, if I'm talking top five, I'm talking top five. Um, I read a variety over this year. I definitely, towards the end of the year, I was leaning more into the romance genre and I did want to include one of those, but I was like, is that my top five? Um, not really, but I read some poetry. I read a little bit of fiction, nonfiction this year. It was kind of a mixed bag, um, but I did enjoy the books that I read. I was, I think that I was getting a little bit frustrated with some of the content. Like I was, last year and the year before, I read, such a volume, such a huge volume of books and was consuming a lot of new literature and trying to offer reviews and critiques on literature um, and keeping up with what is out and what what's popular that I don't think that I really, that I enjoyed reading as much. And I started to develop, you know, a little bit of frustration with some of the content and a lot of the YA literature that I was seeing and then just like you know, just a lot of the popular books just weren't doing it for me. So I think that this year was a little bit more about stepping back um, and using the little bit of time that I did have, because I had a wild schedule this year, using a little bit of time that I did have to actually read books that I wanted to read. So um, my top five, my top five was good. My top five was really good. And overall, my reading year in terms of what I enjoyed was good. So let me stop rambling and let's get into the first book that I want to talk about. The first book that I really want to talk about is Boys Come First by Erin Foley. Um, and if you follow me on Instagram, you've probably seen uh, my post about Boys Come First because I had the amazing opportunity to read this with a group of Black queer men, um, with the group Brothers in Unity here in Columbus, Ohio, run by Sawan Blakely. Shout out to Sawan. He did a phenomenal job um, really putting together this book club and making sure that we had everything we needed um, to just be a successful group reading in community with each other and having a great time. Um, he hosted it at Stonewall Columbus and I was just the moderator. Um, and it was just an amazing time. I think that this is one of those books that you really, really need to read with a group of people because it it provides so much conversation. Um, we also had the amazing opportunity to meet Aaron Foley and discuss the book with him. Um, and so I think that really what I'll say, you know, 
review aside is that Aaron Foley is a black queer man from Detroit who really has like in meeting him and even what I've seen on social media he is so passionate about really getting this book to the people that it's for you know and making and really you know like making the people feel at home with his book and like this is a book that is for them make like making people feel like this is a book that was written with black queer men in mind um and so when you read it when you're reading the stories and you know you're having the conversations with your friends you can really see that this is a book that was written for us you know, I've, I always talk about Elin Harris, you know, reading Elin Harris's books. And I've read a lot of books by Black queer authors. And it's very rare to see Black queer friendships written in this way. You get that feeling for the ups and the downs and, you know, the, the uncomfortable conversations that we often have to have. Um, you know... I think that our lives are full of a lot of complications. You know, we experience a lot of insecurities. We have fallouts with our friends, um, as everybody does. There's also a level of love and care that we put into those intimate relationships we hold the closest. Um, you know, it reminded me of conversations that I have with my friends, um, you know, conversations that I have with my best friend, experiences that I've experienced <laughs> with my best friend and, you know, my close friends. And those, like, just like the hilarious, blunt, open conversations that we have about about love, sex, um, and all the things that make navigating this life thrilling, uncertain, and sometimes, like, outright terrifying. And I think that every single day, you know, we wake up and we continue to live um, in a world that that sometimes we feel so much hatred from, that sometimes we feel like we don't necessarily belong in. Um, and I get so much of that from this book. And this book was uplifting. It really was, it was It was necessary at the time that I read it. And it's, it's a book that I have legitimately recommended to everybody. And I was able to get some of my friends who don't even read to pick up this book and to read with the book club. And, um, and so I really, I, I'm not a super social person. Um, I'm not like a super talkative person when it comes to like going out. Um, but I really felt like uh, like reading this in community was, was so life changing. And um, I was able to meet so many new people and, and open up and talk. Um, and so we're definitely going to be continuing that book club. Um, so, you know, just once again, shout out to Erin Foley. Shout out to Salon for making it possible. Um, it was an amazing experience. And The Boys Come First is a must read. It's one of those books that, you know, I feel like all of the queer authors that came before Aaron Foley prepped the space for such a great book. And I've seen so many people post about this book and I've seen it on so many lists. And it just makes me so happy because this is a phenomenal read and it's so enjoyable. And, you know, it's not like, is not painful to read. You know, the writing is quality, the story is quality. You know, you definitely will be able to um, have so many conversations just after reading this. So definitely pick up Boys Come First by Aaron Foley. Now, I think that it's absolutely necessary that I talk about this book after talking about Boys Come First because I've seen these two authors interact. I've seen um, the books included on a lot of lists together. Um, and I've included this book um, on my Patreon. I did my first Book Tales video was actually about this book. Um, I made it one of my staff picks at Prologue Bookshop where I work part time and I'm not teaching these kids. Um, and that is My Government Means to Kill Me by Rashid Newson. And this was a book that um, we got it into the bookstore and I instantly was like, I need to read this. I looked at the cover, I read the synopsis which I should read. <laughs> so it says, born into a wealthy black Indianapolis family, Earl Trey Singleton III leaves his overbearing parents and their expectations behind by running away to New York City with only a few dollars in his pocket. In the city, Trey meets up with a cast of characters that changes his life forever. 
He volunteers at a renegade home hospice for AIDS patients and after being put to the test by gay rights activists, becomes a member of the AIDS coalition to unleash power, ACT UP. Along the way, Trey attempts to navigate past traumas and searches for ways to maintain familial relationships, all while seeking the meaning of life amid so much death. Vibrant, humorous, and fraught with entanglements, Rashid Newsom's My Government Needs to Kill Me is an exhilarating, fast-paced, coming-of-age story that lends itself to a larger discussion about what it means for a young gay Black man in the mid-1980s to come to term with his role in the midst of a political and social reckoning. And so I think that where Boys Come First is very modern, it's very today, this tackles um, the 1980s, the AIDS crisis, the rise of ACT UP. It's such a fantastically written, fast-paced novel that gives you so much information. I feel like, I feel like it, it has like this very captivating storyline. Um, it has the drama, it has the, the sensual encounters, I'll say. Um, but there is so much queer history that is contained within its pages. I've never seen a fictional novel like this as of late that has had footnotes in it. Like I remember in uh, um, in The Dream House, I was so like shook <laughs> by the footnotes that were within uh, In The Dream House, but that was a memoir. And so to see within a fictional text, um, a story like this, particularly these footnotes, all of these references to history, you see so much information about about some of the most impactful and least acknowledged figures um, within civil rights, within um, the the fight for um, Black queer people um, and queer people in general being uh, acknowledged, the struggle being acknowledged, the pain, the 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 the, the intentional. Um, you know, harm against us during the AIDS crisis. Um, you see so much of that information within the pages. You see references to Bayard Rustin. You see references to people within the civil rights era, the, sh the struggle that Bayard Rustin faced um, being an openly Black queer man at the time. And it's all in just 273 pages. Um, I learned so much from reading this book. Um, and I really think that I really think that queer folks of all ages need to experience this novel because I walked away from it with so much knowledge and wanting to read even more. And so like it's aligned with a lot of the reading that I have done recently when I read um, Let's Just Get Let's Get Back to the Party. Um, I read I started reading Gay Bar. I need to pick up Act Up, Act Up by Sarah Shulman. That's a must read for me in the coming year. I think that My Government Means to Kill Me is a book that you have to pick up. You know, like the history contained within this book is needed. And I think, you know, a Black queer man writing that history um, is something that is needed. So definitely pick up My Government Means to Kill Me by Rasheed Newsom. Well, this next one is going to be kind of quick because I've already posted a review about it. Um, and it definitely is like, I would say that it's, it's, if I had to pick one book that I'd be like, out of all of these, you know, anybody could pick it up and love it. Um, it would be You Made a Fool of Death with Your Beauty by Kweke Amezi. Um, I did a full review of this book on my channel and definitely check that out. Um, I would highly recommend picking this book up. I think that out of all of Kweke Amezi's book, this one is definitely one of the, um, I would say the most accessible texts um, in terms of like, You'll pick it up, you'll open up the book, and you won't be like, what am I reading? And that you really have to like, I, with Akweke Amezi's work, I think that they're such a phenomenal author. Um, but also, they're, like, they're, their novels are tough. <laughs> um, I think that Pet, even as a YA novel, um, it's beautifully written, it's phenomenal. Um, but it's not one of those books that you give to anybody and they'll be like, oh my gosh, I love this. Um, but I think this one is like, you can give it to those that like romance and they'll be like, okay, I can get with this. You can give to those that, that like texts that are, um, intricately written, um, and they'll love it. I think that you can give it to a novice reader and they'll love it. I think that you can give it to somebody 
that really love reading like those, you know, those really deep um, book of prize sort of books. And they'll be like, this is it, okay? Um, so I would highly recommend You Made a Full Death Picture Beauty by Kwake Mezzi. I could ramble about this book forever, but just know it's good, it's messy, um, but you come away with a really great message at the end of it. So would highly recommend. The next book that I really want to talk about, uh, I don't have a physical copy. I listened to this on audio and I will be getting a physical copy soon. It is Nightcrawling by uh, Lila Motley. And um, let me read the synopsis of this book because it's very hard to even like articulate um, everything that this book is about. Um, but I think that the synopsis does a really good job um, saying what, what I can't say. Because I my thoughts don't even necessarily have a lot to do with the plot. Um, I could talk about the plot for days, um, but it has a lot to do with just the beauty of the text. Um, so Nightcrawling um, is about Kara and her brother, Marcus, are scraping by in an East Oakland apartment complex optimistically called the Regal High. Both have dropped out of high school, their family fractured by death in prison. But while Marcus clings to his dream of rap stardom, Kiera hunts for work to pay their rent, which has more than doubled. And to keep the nine-year-old boy next door, abandoned by his mother, safe and fed. One night, what begins as a drunken misunderstanding with a stranger turns into the job Kiera never imagined wanting, but now desperately needs, night crawling. Her world breaks open even further when her name surfaces in an investigation that exposes her as a key witness in a massive scandal within the Oakland Police Department. So, Nightcrawling is pure poetry. That's one thing I will always say about this book. Um, it's so beautifully written that I think that I was so, like, lost on this plot for a hot minute um, because I was like, what is about to happen? I really was just like, what in the world is going on in this book? I started it, and I thought that this was a fantasy novel when I picked it up. I didn't read the synopsis. I just downloaded the audio on Audible and, um, and I started listening. And I'm like, oh my gosh, this book is amazing. And I still didn't know what was going on. Come to find out that the night crawling is sex work. Um, and so Kiera is just like this girl. She dropped out of school. And she's trying to, she's trying to hustle to take care of her family. And so unfortunately due to her um, ain't shit brother, um, who wants to be a rapper, even though he's not even good, and Kiera talks about it multiple times. Even, um, even like, her brother is not doing anything, um, and, oh my gosh, he was, <laughs> I could rant about her brother and how, just how trash he is. Um, he's not taking care of his child, even though, uh, the mother of his child lives with him and is clearly struggling. He's ignoring all the women in his life while they have to sort of pick up the pieces and do what they need to do in order to take care of of um, themselves and the people around them. And um, so I really feel like this novel gives voice to um, to a young girl um, who's existing in a world that is not kind of black women. It's not kind of black girls. Um, because you see all of these women through, uh, throughout uh, this novel that have to hustle and take care of themselves. Um, and, you know, just do, just do what they need to do to survive. Um, meanwhile, like, these men in their lives are just, like, garbage, you know? Um, and I've seen, I've seen it in real life, you know, situations with, like, guys like Kira, who, um, guys like Kira's brother, who legitimately will be like, well, you know, I want to achieve my dreams. I want to do what I need to do. Like, I'm... I'm, you know, I'm hustling for me. I'm going to be a star, you know, even though that dream is just, you know, sometimes we just got to admit it's not for you. It's not for you. And in Kira's brother's case, it's not for him. But he really is just like, oh, I'm going to be a rap star, even though everything is telling him that he's not going to. And so Kira has to pick up all the pieces. And um, and so she does that and she, she goes into sex work um, and she... Uh, she meets all of these people along the way. And I think that one of the most beautifully written characters in this book um, is a trans woman 
um, who really reminds me of Electra from Pose um, in the way that people view her as like this unicorn. And so she does what she needs to do in order to survive in this world as a trans woman. And so I think that this book was extremely poetic. Um, let me go back to my notes because I know I veered off. Um, you know, I think that Kiera and so many of the women in this book just want to be free. Um, and, and so what also is so great is this is inspired by true events. Um, this actual case of police corruption within the Oakland Police Department. And I mean, y'all, the police are going to police. They're going to be who they are, you know, at this point, you know, we're all here for um, defunding and abolishing um, on this side. So um, if you've watched any of my videos, you know how I feel about that. However, um, it is inspired by true events. And I really think that um, that learning about this case, oh, it shook me up. It really shook me up. Like you're going to want to do like your own independent research after reading this novel. Um, so realizing this is inspired by true events, once I listened to the afterward, I was just like, wow, wow. Um, and so Nightcrawling is just a captivating book that you have to pick up y'all. And I would highly recommend listening to the audio. I enjoyed the audio. Um, the girl that read the audiobook, 10 out of 10, phenomenal job. I want to see her in the film. Um, so definitely recommend picking up Nightcrawling by Leela Motley. And so I'll make sure that the cover is somewhere up here. I'll link all of these books in the description below. And now we are at number five. Now we are at number five. Um, so the last book in my top five is a book of poetry. And if you have been following me for a long time, you might remember that my very first YouTube video was a review of this author's memoir, How We Fight for Our Lives. And so Saeed Jones has a new book of poetry called Alive at the End of the World. And um, y'all, I'm not a huge poetry person. I do enjoy poetry. I sometimes enjoy writing poetry. Um, but I'm very particular about the poetry that I enjoy. I think that this is a book of poetry that everybody can enjoy. Um, and I think that uh, a lot of the end of the world is a very searing and timely reflection on our past, our present, and you know, like what could be our future or you know, what our future um, will be like. I think that Saeed Jones really captivates me with this book of poetry in a similar way that he did with, um, with how we fight for our lives in the sense that this book of poetry is excruciatingly vulnerable. Um, the way that Said is able to address the grief sort of as an extension of uh, his memoir, How We Fight For Our Lives, talking about um, the death of his mother. Um, you know, you know, relationships, his past, his present. Um, you know, addressing the pandemic in a way where it's not like annoying. Um, because this is a book of poetry that was written during the pandemic. Um, and so, and not only that, but this book of poetry is extremely haunting in the way that you do get poems where, where he takes on the voice of the icons that we've lost, um, Luther, Whitney. And I think that particularly with uh, the Whitney, Luther, and Little Richard poems, it's, it's so wild because I've read, I've been reading so much about them and you know, I, I love Luther and I love Whitney um, like so much. And around the time that I'd received an arc um, of Saeed Jones' book of poetry, um, I was also reading uh, Didn't We Almost Have It All um, in defense of Whitney Houston. And I had reread Black Girl Call Home again and in that, um, and in uh, Did We Almost Have It All, there is so much about Whitney and, you know, the failures of our society um, and the way, the way that society failed her um, and the way that just like the climate of the world that we lived in failed her. Um, and it's so heartbreaking thinking about Whitney's life. Um, and Luther's life, 
you know i've been listening to a lot more luther and i've been paying very close attention to the lyrics and i'm just like luther was queer whitney was queer um so it's interesting because luther and whitney uh luther did a cover of all the man that i need um and called it all the woman i need and sometimes I, i'll tell my friends i'm just like you know it would be so wild if we ever heard them switch versions um and i just it always breaks my heart thinking about whitney and luther and what it would be like if the world was a place that was safe for black queer people um during their lifetime and so saeed has a couple of poems that give voice to them um give voice to robin crawford um who was the love of whitney's life um you can't deny that and so i think that a lot at the end of the world really forces us. It, what I got out of it was it forced me and, and it's sort of like a message forcing us all to confront who we really are. Um, and so I just thought that it was a phenomenal book of poetry and I would highly recommend it for anybody. Even if you don't necessarily love poetry, I think that it's a book for you and I think that it's really timely um, at this point uh, in the world that we live in. Um, these are my top five books uh, of 2022. I would highly recommend picking up all these books. In the comment section below, let me know what your top five were in the year 2022. And what are you looking forward to reading in the year 2023? Um, I'm looking forward to reading those comments and responding. And make sure that you follow me on all my social media. Make sure you subscribe to my Patreon if you want to support me just a little bit extra. And I will see all of you in the next one. And always remember that you are loved.